Well, I live in Falls Church, Virginia, so I'm a local author, and I came for the first time last year when my second novel came out, and just had a wonderful experience because the audience was very responsive, and also I got to meet so many other authors and network with so many other authors in a way that has just been really productive for my career. Kathleen McCleary is a journalist and author of three novels, Leaving Haven, A Simple Thing, which was nominated for the Library of Virginia Literary Awards in Fiction and House and Home. A former columnist, her work has also appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Good Housekeeping, and other publications. You're very busy. Yeah, <laughs> she's very busy. When she's not writing, Kathleen teaches writing. She is also taught as an adjunct professor at American University and is an instructor with Ritopia Labs, a nonprofit that teaches writing to kids and they're actually here today. The author of All Numbers says, Leaving Haven is a powerful story of love, loss, deception, desire, and most of all, family and friendship. McCleary's characters are so honestly rendered that even when they're at their worst, you understand and care about them. Having just read the book, I would agree and add that Kathleen was able to take me away into the story with her outstanding character development as I read. Kathleen lives in Northern Virginia with her husband and two daughters. Please help me welcome her to the Gaithersburg Book Festival. Hi, thanks a lot for coming out today. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is contemporary women's fiction, which is what I write, and I, it's that genre because it's contemporary and there are women in my fiction. So what I really wanted to talk about is the writing process, because that's what I know. Um, and there are two things everybody asks me since I've become a novelist. The first is, do you write an outline? And the second is, how autobiographical is your fiction? Because they assume that every character in every book is based on someone from real life. So I'll address the easy part first. It's kind of like show and tell for authors. I'm going to show you how I plot a book. And then I'm going to tell you a lot of stories that made it somehow into my fiction. So I um, the world of writing really has two types. They have uh, plotters who write outlines and then they have what they call pantsers who are seat of the pants and uh, I'm a pantser and uh, have never outlined a book but I wrote two novels that way and then with my third novel I had actually sold it before it was written and I was working with an editor at HarperCollins and I sent her the first chunk of the book which had two different points of view and she said great, but I think these two points of view are kind of similar. Why don't you tell one story moving forwards in time and one story backwards in time? And that was kind of a like, wow. At first I thought, wow, great. And then I thought, wow, oh my God, that's so hard to do. I don't know how I'll figure that out. But I also realized that it meant I couldn't be a complete pantser for this novel. So um, I tried writing one story forwards and one backwards by the seat of my pants and realized that wasn't going to work. But when I tried to outline things, I got really stuck. And one thing my agent has always said to me that's great about not plotting too much is that if there are no surprises for the writer, then there are no surprises for the reader. And I really do believe that because I've been surprised so much in the process of writing my own books that um, I always feel like, well, that must surprise the people who read it. So I got kind of stuck, and so I did what any good writer would do. I Googled what to do if you're stuck when you're writing a book. And uh, I just came across something called mind mapping, which can be used for any discipline. And really what it is is kind of a, a visual outline. And so it's just taking the idea of outlining but drawing it. And so like some good elementary student, I actually made a mind map for my novel, and I brought, this is the show and tell part, I brought my mind map to show you. They suggest you start with a central idea, and this book that I wrote is about a woman who gives birth to a baby she's wanted for years, and then she walks out of the hospital and leaves the baby behind. And over the course of the novel, you come to find out why she would do that. 
So I had to do my mind map, and so I put at the heart of it a baby, because that's what it's about. And I just cut out a big picture of my daughter, who's now 17, and that's how I constructed the mind map. So here it is. And that's what I made. And uh, so there's my baby when she was little. And it really helped me kind of figure out the different storylines and where they were going, but without kind of every single little bit of it mapped out. Um, so I still had some surprises. So here's my show and tell. It kind of looks like a fifth grade project, I know, but it was fun to break out the colored pencils and do something different. Um, the second thing that has become a big part of what I get asked about the writing process has to do with how autobiographical everything is. Um, I um, have written three novels now and you know as soon as I write a novel my friends immediately come to me and say oh well so this one's your husband and this character is your daughter and this character is your other daughter but I can't figure out who this character is and I have to say well I, I made it up um, but uh, my second novel was about a woman who had a teenage daughter who had some problems including a serious drinking problem and shortly after it was published a book club in my local town asked me to come and talk to them about the book and I was really excited because I knew the women at the book club I thought this is really going to be fun and I walked in and there um, was this group of women sitting looking really serious and I sat down and looked around and one of them finally said I'm so sorry about your daughter's drinking problem <laughs> and I <laughs> had to say well my daughter doesn't have a drinking problem that's a character in the book and someone said, you mean your little sister didn't drown? And I said, nope, I don't have a sister. I made it up. <laughs> and so it's been um, quite a process of distinguishing fact from fiction. But that said, um, I do think it's very true. I read another author said once that when it comes to writing fiction, all the feelings in the books are facts. It's just the facts that are fiction. And so I would say all the emotions and feelings in the books are very autobiographical. And I have a couple great examples of this in my latest book in which I used real things that had happened and kind of turned them into fiction. One is kind of funny and one is really has to do with one of the scariest moments of my life. So the first one, um, in this book there's a character who's kind of very uptight and rigid and had a very difficult childhood in which her mother was really neglectful. And so um, I was trying to think what kind of you know anecdote could I have about a mom who really wasn't on the ball all the time. And I came up with a story um, <laughs> that from my husband's family. So when my husband was in eighth grade, he took a course called Bachelor Arts in middle school, which I'm sure would be much more correctly named now. And he learned how to make donuts. And so he thought this was great. So he went home one day, his parents were out, and he thought, well, wow, maybe I'll make some donuts. So he set the grease to cook on the fire, on the stove, and put the lid on and went out to shoot a few baskets while the grease and oil heated up. And he came back in and took the lid off, and the flame shot up. So he panicked and grabbed a bucket of water and threw it on the fire and whoosh. So he didn't burn down the house, just the kitchen, and no one was hurt, um, but there was a lot of smoke damage and uh, he didn't make donuts again. Uh, so anyway, when I was trying to think of what could this child Alice have had happen to her that, you know, might be show her mother was neglectful this donut making episode came to mind and so I wrote this scene in which um, Alice's mother Rita is meeting Alice's fiance Duncan for the first time and Rita is talking about her daughter's childhood Alice could cook by the time she was six Rita said she knew how to do the laundry too one time she even put out a fire all by herself 
Duncan raised his eyebrows. Rita nodded. She was seven or eight. She was a very skinny kid. I was making donuts. She loved donuts, and I wanted her to put some meat on her bones, you know? I put the oil to heat in that big old cast iron skillet we had. Remember that, Alice? You needed two hands to lift it. It was so heavy. Alice bit her lower lip. Anyway, Rita said, picking up her drink, I stepped outside for a cigarette and ran into a friend, and we started to chat, and I forgot about the donuts until the fire trucks came screaming up. She shook her head. Grease fire. Turns out little Alice came into the kitchen, saw those flames, and ran for the baking soda, dumped the whole box onto that fire. I wouldn't even have known to do that. She'd heard it on TV. Then she called 911. Rita beamed at Duncan. Like I said, I knew she'd make a great wife. So the real-life donut story became the fictional donut story. The second example of that um, in this book really has to do with a story that was so scary for me at the time that I even get kind of tense talking about it. But um, I have two daughters who are now uh, teenagers, but... My husband and I have vacationed for almost 40 years now at a lake in the Adirondacks. We go up to the same lake every summer. We went as children. We rent the same cabin, and we bring our daughters. And uh, a few years ago, when our daughters were 11 and 13, we decided family vacations are more fun if you import some friends. So we had them bring three friends. So we went up to the lake. We were there the first day, the girls and their friends. and. That evening, the girl said, can we go for a walk and walk down to the beach? And, you know, it's just a little stretch of sand on a very small lake. And I said, sure, it's about a half-mile walk. And so the girls walked off, and, you know, some time went by, and then it got dark, and then more time went by, and I realized the kids still weren't home, and now it was, you know, probably 9, 30, 10 p.m., and it was pitch black out, and I had, you know, an 11-year-old and a 12-year-old and three 13-year-olds, I think. So, um, and, you know, pitch black in the Adirondacks in the country is really black. So I decided I'd go look for them in the car. So I drove down the road to the little beach, and there was no sign of them. So there's really only one road. I drove the other way, and there was no sign of them. So I thought, well, you know, they must have um, walked home, and somehow I missed them. And now we have a long probably a quarter mile long driveway to our cabin. And it winds around through the woods. And so I was going slowly up this driveway. And I rounded a corner and there were two state trooper cars with their lights flashing in front of my cabin. And in 40 years, I had never had a state trooper appear in front of my cabin. And I thought, well, state troopers come to your house because they want to tell you someone's dead. And for some reason, I parked the car, I don't know why, and jumped out and sprinted to the house. Um, and I was thinking, oh my God, not only might my, my kids be dead, but even worse, somebody else's kids are dead on my watch. So um, I ran up to the front door of the house, and there was a trooper standing on the front stoop. And he looked at me, and he said, they're fine. And I said, no, there's five of them. And he said, there's five of them and they're fine. <laughs> and um, I walked in and there were these girls crying, lined up on the couch and another trooper. They had been skinny dipping. And uh, when they got out of the lake, they got dressed and they were giggling and walking down the road. And you know, cars never go by. A car drove by and one of the girls was feeling playful and just raised her top and went, whoop. And it was an off-duty state trooper. <laughs> so he called for backup. And uh, they decided to haul these girls in just to teach them about the dangers of flashing passing motorists at night. But uh, it still remains, you know, I think it gave me 5,000 gray hairs because it just was so terrifying to round that corner and see the trooper cars there. So. In the process of writing this book about this woman who leaves her baby behind but is really struggling with a decision about can she keep the baby and how much does she love the baby, my editor said to me, well, you know, you need some moment in which she thinks the baby's been lost to her for all time to really help her clarify how she feels about the baby. So I immediately thought of the state trooper car. 
And uh, this is the scene I wrote. Georgia is the mother, and uh, she has a teenage daughter named Liza, and her baby is named Haven. That's the title of the book, Leaving Haven. They all turned at the sound of car tires on the gravel road. Georgia put the bowl down on the table. Liza's here, she said. She hadn't realized how she had missed her daughter, how eager she was for Liza's smile, her voice, for all of her. She flew down the step from the kitchen to the porch, flung open the screen door, and stepped onto the wooden stoop. But the car that pulled up next to the house wasn't Polly's red station wagon. It was a big blue SUV with flashing red lights and the yellow logo of the New York State Police on the side. Two troopers got out of the car. Is it my daughter, Georgia said? Did something happen to my daughter? No, the first trooper said, the older one. Your daughter's fine. You're, oh, Jesus. Georgia's heart hammered against her ribcage. It's my husband. I knew something must have happened, and that's why I couldn't reach him. Is he dead? No, the trooper said. It's the baby. Haven's loss, which until this moment had been deep but abstract, suddenly exploded into something large and black and so all-encompassing it threatened to devour Georgia, a black hole. Who cared if he looked like Alice? He wasn't part of Alice the way he was part of Georgia. Georgia was the one who had felt his heartbeats in her own body as he had felt hers in his, the one who had dreamed about him, known him, loved him. This is what happens when you throw away what you should treasure most. Ma'am, the trooper said, no one is dead. And so um, that's kind of the best example I can give of how you take feelings that are really autobiographical and turn them into fiction. And so that's what I know about the process of writing based on my own experience. Um, I want to really thank everybody for coming out today, and I am happy to answer any questions if anyone has questions or comments or anything else. Oh, so the question was, when did I start writing? I um, was a lifelong reader. I was a real bookworm as a kid, and um, but I majored in comparative religion in college and got a liberal arts degree, and then I went into journalism, and I was a journalist for 20-some years before I started writing fiction. I really always wanted to write a novel, but I thought, well, I don't think I would ever have an idea that would sustain a whole novel. But then... Um, I, I moved cross country and in the process of doing that had to sell this house I really loved. And I got the idea of a woman who had to sell a house she loved because she was getting a divorce and who loved it so much she decided to burn it down so no one else could ever have it. Not that I tried to burn down my old house, but there were times I wished I could because I just really loved that house. Um, so once I had that, it wasn't, it was something I felt passionately about. And what I really, I teach writing, what I, I don't think it's important to write what you know, I think it's important to write what you love. Because when you really are passionate and interested in something, or it just, really resonates with you, it can sustain you through a lot of bad drafts and long days and nights in a chair working on things. So, uh, I used to teach at American University. Now I teach creative writing to kids through Writopia. Um, so I teach workshops for, for kids in Falls Church. Yes. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I, do, I really do think if you can mine emotions, even if it's not episodes or people, that, that gives an emotional truth to a book. That, and that's what people respond to in fiction. It's not necessarily you know, I really relate to this trapeze artist, but I relate to that sense of terror because I've known terror in my own life. So um, I, I think the more you can stick with that emotional truth, the, the better the book. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. 
Yes, I'm working on my fourth novel right now, um, which is about uh, an elderly woman who decides to hike the Appalachian Trail. So, uh-huh. And that's it. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I try to do that. Um, when I started writing, my kids were both were younger, eight, they were eight and 10, and um, it was harder. I try to write in the morning because I find I'm the most productive then. But um, my, this book, I wrote on deadline. I, sold, I actually sold my second and third novels in a two book deal to HarperCollins, and so I sold this book before I'd written it. So I had a deadline, which is a great motivator. Um, and so I really, I, I more set a word count, so I try to write a thousand words a day, and uh, I often fall short, but if I get 500 good words a day, I feel like that's something, and so usually it's just whatever it takes to get, you know, at my desk and in the chair to get those 500 words, but it may be three hours in the morning and an hour in the late afternoon and another hour late at night, but so it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's a good question about how far the final product is from the original concept for the book. And I'd say it changes quite a bit. You know, when I sold this book, they made me write a one-paragraph plot summary that um, has little resemblance to the final book. Um, so it does change a lot, but that said, uh, you know, I also think that it's true that it's hard to write a novel if you don't know where you're going. So with all the novels I've written, I've had a sense of what kind of the big climactic scene was going to be and tried to write my characters to there. And, you know, on the most simple level, as I teach kids when I teach creative writing, every book is about somebody wanting something they can't have. And then there are all these obstacles to getting it. And they may get it or not get it, but that's what drives the book forward. And so I do always try to think about, you know, what they want and if they're going to get it or not get it and how it's all going to kind of blow up in one big dramatic scene. So, yes. Oh, how did I get an agent? And Yeah, well, it was interesting because when I wrote my first novel, I had um, never written fiction before. And I just had this idea about the woman who wanted to burn down her house. And I started writing the novel, and I wrote like four or five chapters. And then I realized I know absolutely nothing about writing novels. Um, and so I took an online novel writing class through uh, Media Bistro, which is a website, a kind of journalism website. And that really helped me because as a journalist, I was so deadline oriented. The, the idea that it, I met once a week with this group online and if I could get a chapter, they would read it. It really helped me move forward and getting the feedback on my work helped me see what was working and not working. So. I just took this same online novel writing class over and over until I finished writing the novel. And then, um, you know, then I thought, well, I guess I have to get an agent. So I just did really good homework. I got Jeff Herman's Guide to Literary Agents, and I looked through it, and I looked for agents who represented the kind of fiction that my book was, which was contemporary women's fiction. And then I followed directions very well. So if the agents wanted, you know, three pages of my novel, I sent them three pages. If they wanted a chapter, I sent a chapter, and I wrote a cover letter. And I actually had a very good success rate. I got a lot of response, a lot of agents requested the book, and then I got a lot of offers for representation. So I was in the fortunate position of being able to choose an agent, and then my agent took the book out and sold it to uh, well, my first book was with Hyperion, and my last two have been with Harper Collins. So, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Thanks. Anything else? Yes. Uh, 76. Yeah. So, 
It's been a really fun book. And I actually hiked part of the Appalachian Trail last year, and so that's what gave me the idea for the book. And it's been a fun one to research. It also has a historical storyline, which is the first time I've done historical fiction about the displacement that took place in Shenandoah National Park. When the park was created, they condemned the homes of more than 500 families and evicted them from the park. And so that's a big part of the book, too. Yeah. Yes. Oh, he did? The whole thing? The whole thing. Wow. I only walked 60 miles of it, so kudos. Wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yes. <laughs> and well, and I, th I know a lot of people who have changed careers and gone in, and I do think you learn by doing. I feel I get better with every book that, you know, my first book had a lot of emotional truth, but, you know, the character and plot might have used from some work, and this book is better than my second, and I think my next one is is even better than this. So I, I you do learn a lot by by doing it, and sometimes that's the only way through. Yes. Uh huh. Did I have a lot of money? Did I have what? Oh, no, well, no, not really, um, because, you know, I really, it was just taking the classes that I spent money on. And to be honest, the other thing I had to spend money on is my agent called me when she took the book out and said, you know, we have four publishers who are interested in your book, and I want you to come up to New York tomorrow, and you got to look really great, because I've told them you're going to be so good at marketing this book because you're so well dressed and I said you know I sit in a room in flip flops and sweatpants and I, you know I can't come to New York tomorrow so she had me go to the personal shopper at Bloomingdale's and buy an outfit to meet all these publishers and so I you know I don't think that's what sold my book for me but I did have to spend a lot more money than I ever spent on an outfit for to go up to New York and meet publishers. So, But it really, I do think taking classes is worthwhile because it, it always elevates your fiction. And if you can't afford that, even just to be in a writer's critique group, even now I'm in a writer's critique group and I am in a group with three other published authors, including Alison Leota, who's here today. She writes thrillers. And um, having these other authors read my work in progress and give me feedback on it has really elevated my fiction to a whole nother level. So, anything else? Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and your interest.